Who's a Cinderella? Chapter one, Prince Charming misplaces his bride. Oh, Frederick, it's the story of Frederick. He wasn't always helpless. There was a time when he aspired to become a hero, but it seemed it wasn't meant to be. From the moment he was born and immediately placed into the delicate swishiness of a pure silk bassinet, that's another kind of fancy baby cradle, Prince Frederick led a life of comfort. As heir to the throne of the very wealthy nation of Harmonia, he grew up with an army of servants standing ready to pamper him in every way imaginable. While learning to crawl, he was fitted with lamb's wool knee pads to keep his baby soft skin from getting scuffed. When he wanted to play hide and seek, butlers and valets would hide in the most obvious places like behind a feather or under a napkin so that the boy wouldn't have to work too hard to find them. Can you imagine playing hide and seek with someone and they go and hide under a napkin? That wouldn't be a very fun game, I don't think. Pretty much anything young Frederick could have wanted or needed was handed to him on a silver platter, literally. The only thing Frederick had to do in return was live the life of a proper gentleman. He was allowed to attend as many poetry readings, ballroom dances, and 12 course luncheons as he wanted. But he was forbidden to take part in any activity that could be considered remotely risky or dangerous. Appearances were very important to Frederick's father, King Wilberforce, who vowed that no one in his family would ever again suffer the cruel mockery that had been heaped upon his great-grandfather, King Charles the Chicken Poxed. Not a scar, not a bruise, not a blemish, was the motto of King Wilberforce. Now, that's very not very nice to say that someone used to make fun of King Wilberforce because he had some scars from having chicken pox. But just because of that doesn't mean that you know, you shouldn't be able to do anything so that you don't get any scars or bruises or blemished. Poetry readings and ballroom dances and 12, 12 course luncheons sound pretty fun, but you'd probably want to do some other stuff too. He went to extreme measures to keep his son away from anything that might give him so much as a scratch. He even had Frederick's pencils pre-dulled. For most of his early years, Frederick was perfectly happy to skip out on pastimes like tree climbing twisted ankles, tree, uh, hiking, poison ivy, and uh, embroidery, pointy needles. King Wilberforce's warnings about the hazards of such endeavors sank in good and deep. But at the tender age of seven, Frederick was inspired to try something daring. He was in his private classroom being taught to write his name with fancy curlicue letters. Fancy curlicue letters are letters that have extra lines, extra fancy parts coming off of them. When a commotion down the hall caused his tutor to cut the lesson short, Frederick followed his tutor down to the palace gates where many of the servants had gathered to gawk at a visiting knight. The old warrior, who was battered and exhausted from a recent bout with a dragon, had staggered up to the palace seeking food and shelter. The king invited the weary visitor inside. This was the first knight Frederick had ever seen in real life, and frankly, even the ones that he'd read about in books were not very exciting. His favorite bedtime story? You're gonna laugh at this. It's pretty silly for a favorite bedtime story about a knight. This knight is called Sir Bertram the Dainty and the quest for the enchanted salad fork. It's not even a quest for an enchanted, I don't know, sword, no, or maybe even like an enchanted spoon. I feel like a spoon would be more exciting than an enchanted salad fork. A salad fork isn't even a full size fork. It's like a little bit smaller fork. Doesn't sound very exciting to me. But that was his favorite bedtime story. During the night's short stay, a fascinated Frederick followed him everywhere, listening to his tales of ogre battles, goblin wars, and bandit chases. There was a look in the man's eyes that Frederick had never seen before. Frederick could sense the knight's thirst for thrills, his yearning for action. The knight was a man who thrived on adventure the way Frederick thrived on tea cakes. So he thrived on adventure the way Frederick thrived on tea cakes. Thrived means you do really well when you're getting that thing. So that would be like, I maybe like I thrive on Honey Nut Cheerios. I don't know what you thrive on, but the knight thrives on thrills. Frederick thrives on tea cakes. I thrive on Honey Nut Cheerios. You know, we all have our things. That evening after the knight departed, Frederick asked his father if he could take sword fighting lessons. The king dismissed his request with a smile. Swords are sharp, my boy, and I need a son with both ears attached. 
but young Frederick was undaunted. He, the next day, he asked his father if he could take a shot at wrestling instead. King Wilder Wilberforce shook his head. You're what they call petite, Frederick. You'd have your spine snapped in an instant. The day after that, Frederick requested a spot on the jousting team. That's more dangerous than the other two combined, the king moaned disapprovingly. You'll be skewered like a cocktail weenie. Archery, Frederick asked. Eyes poked out, the king insisted. Martial arts? Bones broken. Mountaineering. Eyes broken, bones poked out. By the end of the week, King Wilberforce couldn't take it anymore. He needed to put a stop to Frederick's thrill-seeking dreams. He decided to set his son up for a fall. Father, can I try spelunking? Frederick asked eagerly. Spelunking is when you go investigating in a deep, dark cave. Frederick was really wanted to try something exciting, didn't he? Cave exploration? You'll fall into a bottomless pit, the king chided. Then he changed his tone. But you can try animal training, if you like. Really? Frederick was stunned and thrilled. You mean with wild animals, not hamsters or goldfish? The king nodded. Don't you think I'll be eaten alive? Frederick asked. Oh, I fear you will, said the king. But if you're so determined to put your life at risk, perhaps I shouldn't stand in your way, his father said, weaving his deception. His deception, that's a fancy way of saying his lies. The next day, with his heart racing, Frederick was led down a winding basement corridor to a storeroom in which all the old coats of arms, spare scepters, and crates of outgrown baby clothes had been shoved up inside the walls to make room for an enormous cave. Inside that cave, a pacing, panting tiger. The lion let out a loud growl as soon as it saw the young prince. <laughs> wow, huh? I didn't know we'd start with something so big, <laughs> Frederick said, considerably less eager than he had been a moment earlier. And I mean, fair enough. If I was going to start training wild animals, I would think, you know, something smaller, not a tiger to start with. A tiger seems like you're really just jumping in the deep end. Are you ready for this, your highness? The animal's trainer asked. Frederick barely had time to nod before the trainer slid past the bolt and let the cage door fall open. The trainer uttered a quick word to the tiger, and the big cat burst into the room, rushing straight at Frederick. Frederick screamed ah! and ran. The giant tiger, easily three times the size, dashed after the boy. Frederick darted among, oh, darted among oh, the crates of tarnished goblets and out-of-tune lutes, looking for some place to hide. Why aren't you stopping it? He shouted at the trainer. I can't stop it, the trainer replied. It's a wild animal. Your father told you this would be dangerous. Fred ducked under a heavy wooden table, but the tiger swatted it away as if it was nothing more than a piece of dandelion fluff. Frederick scrambled across the floor in an attempt to get away from the beast, but was soon backed up against a stack of rolled tapestries. There was nowhere for him to go. With tears running down his face, Frederick shrieked as he saw the tiger's open mouth coming at him. When the tiger snatched him up in his maw, that's in his mouth, Frederick was too terrified to realize that the animal had no teeth. Uh oh The big cat calmly carried the limp, weeping boy back to his cage and set him gently down on the floor, which is what he had been trained to do. For this was no ordinary tiger. This was El Stripo, the talented and cooperative star of the Flimsham Brothers Circus. The Flimshams were famous for their visually horrifying but impressively safe act, in which El Stripo's trainer would stuff the tiger's mouth with up to five infants from the audience. Can you imagine that? Five babies stuffed in a tiger's mouth, and then instruct the animal to spit them back at their mothers. The babies almost always landed in the correct laps. So actually, Frederick wasn't in any danger at all. He just was scared. It took Frederick a few seconds to realize he hadn't been harmed, at which point his father appeared. Frederick ran into the king's arms, bearing his wet face in his father's royal robes. Do you see now? the king asked. Do you see why I say you can't do these things? Behind Frederick's back, he flashed El Stripo's trainer a thumbs up. That was a pretty mean trick. Frederick just wanted to do something a little tiny bit exciting, and the king set him up so that he'd get a scary, scary encounter with a tiger. King Wilberforce's plan had worked. The prince was so deeply frightened by his experience with the tiger, so chilled to the core, that he never asked to try anything daring again. Father was right, he thought. I am not cut out for such bold escapades. 
fear ruled Frederick from that moment on. He even found a few Sir Bertram the Dainty stories to be a little too scary. Instead, Frederick focused his energies on taking etiquette lessons, that's like manners, putting together stylish outfits, and becoming exactly the kind of prince his father wanted him to be. And he became pretty darn good at it. In fact, he began to love it. He was proud of his excellent posture, his artful flower arranging, and his flawless foxtrot. A foxtrot is a fancy kind of dance. More than a decade passed before the thought of adventure found its way back into Frederick's mind. We're about to get to a part of the story that we already know something about. Remember, we know that Prince Frederick, he's the one who lost Cinderella. Cinderella's about to come into the story, so let's see what happens with her. It happened on the night of the big palace ball, at which it was hoped that Frederick would find a bride, and he never left the palace, so this type of event was the only way for him to meet new girls. He had to have a party at home because he wasn't allowed to leave. Among the dozens of elegant women at the ball one night, there was one girl who caught Frederick's attention immediately. And it wasn't just because she was so beautiful and elegantly dressed. Nope, she had something else. A daredevil gleam in her eyes. He'd seen that look only once before, in that old night, all those years ago. Frederick and the mystery girl had the time of their lives dancing together. But at midnight, she ran off without a word. Now we know why Cinderella did that, but Frederick doesn't know why. Father, I have to find that girl, insisted Frederick, newly inspired and feeling a bit more like his seven-year-old self again. Son, you've never been outside the palace gates, the king replied in a foreboding tone. What if there are tigers out there? Frederick shrank away. The tiger episode had really done a number on him. But Frederick didn't give up entirely. He instructed his trusted valet, Reginald, to find the mystery woman for him. It turned out that Ella, that was her name, wasn't a noble woman at all, just a sooty cleaning girl. But her story, the way she mixed it up with a fairy and used magical means to escape her wicked stepfamily, intrigued Frederick, even if he hoped he'd never have to meet any of her relatives. When he told his father he wanted to marry Ella, the king sputtered in surprise. I thought I'd fixed you, but apparently I didn't, the king scowled. You don't get it at all, do you? An ill-bred wife would destroy your image more than any scar or broken limb ever would. Up until that point, Frederick had always believed that the king enforced strict rules because he feared for his son's safety. But now he saw that wasn't necessarily the case. So, for the first time, Frederick stood up to his father. You do not rule me, he stated firmly. Well, technically you do, because you're the king. But you do not rule my heart. My heart wants... Ella, and if you don't bring her here to be with me, I will go to her. I don't care how dangerous it is out there. I would ride a tiger to get her if I had to. It sounds pretty brave. In truth, Frederick was utterly intimidated by the thought of venturing out into the real world. If his father had refused to meet his demands, he had no idea if he would be able to follow through on his threat. But luckily for him, the king was shocked enough to give in. And so, Ella came to live at the palace. Well, Cinderella, come to live at the palace. She and Frederick were officially engaged to marry, and the tale of the magical way in which the couple met became the talk of the kingdom. Within days, the minstrels had a new hit on their hands, a new hit song all about Cinderella, and the tale was told and retold across many realms. But while the popular version of the story ended with a happily ever after for Prince Charming and Cinderella, things didn't go as smoothly for the real Frederick and Ella. Do you ever wonder about that sometimes? We get to the end of the fairy tale and it says happily ever after, but happily ever after, that's a long time. Let's see what happens for this Prince Charming and Ella. Ironically, it was Ella's bold and venturesome spirit, the very thing that Frederick found so attractive about her that came between them. Ella's dreadful stepmother had treated her like a prison in her own home and forced her to spend nearly every waking hour performing onerous tasks. An onerous task is something that's hard to do, takes a lot of time, something you don't want to do. An onerous task like scrubbing grout ugh, or chipping congealed mayonnaise from between fork tines. Ugh, that does not sound like any fun at all. I don't like mayonnaise at the best of times. While Ella suffered through all this, she dreamed of a more exhilarating life. 
She fantasized about riding camels across deserts to search ancient temples for magic lamps or scaling cloud-covered peaks to play games of chance with the rulers of hidden mountain kingdoms. She honestly believed that anything could happen in her future. When Ella met Frederick at the ball, it was the climax of a day filled with magic and intrigue, and she assumed it was the beginning of a non-stop, thrill-a-minute existence for her. But life with Frederick was not quite what she'd expected. Frederick tended to sleep in, sometimes until lunch. I mean, sounds kind of nice to me, but you probably wouldn't want to do that every day. And then he'd spend over an hour grooming himself to his father's specifications. So an hour every day, like just brushing his hair and getting ready. By the time Ella finally saw him each day, she would be more than ready for some sort of excitement. But Frederick usually suggested a more subdued activity like picnicking or listening to music or quietly admiring some art. And now, don't get me wrong, I think those are all nice activities. It can be lots of fun going on a picnic or listening to music or quietly admiring some art. But I can see why Ella might wanna do some other things too. No, don't get me wrong, Ella enjoyed all those things for the first few days. But by the 14th picnic, she began to fear that those same few activities were all she was ever going to do at the palace. Her unchanging routine made her feel uncomfortably like a prisoner again. So one morning she decided she would speak frankly with Frederick about what she needed. That morning as usual, Frederick slept late. When he eventually got up, he spent 15 minutes, which is pretty quick for him, browsing a closet filled with ultra fancy suits before finally deciding on a crisp white outfit trimmed with gold braiding and tasseled shoulder pads. Sounds very fancy indeed. The five minutes after that were dedicated to straightening his hair, light brown. Uh, unfortunately, a few stubborn strands refused to stay in place, and so the prince did what he did and he, whenever he got frustrated. Reginald! Within seconds. A tall, slender man with a thin, pointy mustache popped into the prince's bedroom. Yes, my lord, he said, in a voice stiff enough to match his rigid posture. Good morning, Reginald, Frederick said. Can you fix my hair? Certainly, my lord, Reginald said, as he grabbed a silver brush and began using it to tidy the prince's bedhead. Thank you, Reginald, Frederick said. I'm off to see Ella, and I want to look my best. Of course, my lord. I think I'm going to have Cook surprise her with breakfast in bed. Reginald paused. I... Reasonably sure, my lord, that the young lady has already eaten breakfast. Drat, muttered the prince, so it's happened again. How long ago did she wake up? About three hours ago, Reginald replied. Three hours? But I asked you to wake me when Ella got up. I'm sorry, my lord, Reginald said sympathetically. You know I'd love to help you, but we're under strict orders from the king. Your beauty sleep is not to be disturbed. Frederick burst from his seat, waving away Reginald's brush. My father ordered you not to wake me. He's still trying to keep me and Ella apart. He rushed to the door of his bedroom, then quickly back to the mirror for one last check of his hair, and then out and down the hall to look for his fiance. Ella wasn't in her room, so Frederick headed to the gardens. He paused briefly to sniff a rose bush when he heard the sound of approaching hoofbeats. He looked over his shoulder to see that a large white horse was bearing down on him, tearing through the garden at a fast gallop, leaping over one hedgerow over another. It sounds Pretty exciting, this giant horse is coming. The prince tried to run, but the golden castle on his jacket caught on the shrub's thorns. Frederick tugged frantically at his stuck sleeve as the horse's rider pulled up the reins and brought the steed to a halt. From the saddle, Ella looked down on him and laughed. Not meanly, but you know, it's a little funny he's stuck in the bushes. She wore a distinctly unfancy blue dress and her tied back hair was disheveled from the ride. Her strong athletic build and warm, healthy glow were a stark contrast to Frederick's silver frame and sun-deprived complexion. I hope you haven't been stuck there all morning, she said, only half joking. No, this just happened, Frederick said, revealed. <laughs> it just happened. You know, he hasn't been stuck in the bush all morning. That's good. I don't suppose you could possibly hop down and lend me a hand. Ella slid off the saddle, patted her horse's nose, and crouched down to help free the prince's jacket from the thorns. I told you, those tassels will get you in trouble someday, she said. But they're what all the most fashionable noblemen are wearing these days, Frederick said brightly. He brushed himself off and struck a chest out, hands on hips pose to show off his outfit. He hemmed it up to get a laugh out of Ella. It worked. Very nice, Alice said with a chuckle. I'd love to see you up on a horse sometime, she hinted, petting her mare's pink nose. Yes, I'm sure I'd look positively heroic up there, Frederick said. It's a shame I'm allergic to horse hair. He wasn't allergic. 
He was afraid of falling off. A terrible shame, said Ella. I didn't realize you knew how to ride, Frederick said. Considering the way your stepmother kept you under lock and key, I wouldn't have thought you had much time for equestrian, lestern, <laughs> equestrian lessons. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Equestrian is another word for horseback riding. I didn't, Ella said. Charles, your head groom has been teaching me these past few weeks. I usually practice in the mornings while you, while you're sleeping. Hmm. Frederick changed the subject. So, um, have you heard the song that Pennyfeather wrote about you? That bard of ours certainly has a way with a quill. The song is very popular, I right hear. Supposedly, the minstrels are singing it as far away as Silveria and Sturmhagen. Before you know it, you'll be more famous than me, or even more famous than Pennyfeather. Um, although, I don't really like the fact that he named you Cinderella. It makes you sound dirty and unkempt. Frederick's talking about the story that we know, that someone has made up a story about him and Cinderella. I don't mind, said Ella. I was dirty and unkempt for years. I was always covered in soot and cinders from cleaning the fireplace, so at least I see where he got the name from. Speaking of names, said Frederick, have you noticed that the song refers to me as Prince Charming? My real name's not in there at all. People are going to think I'm the same prince from that Sleeping Beauty song or the Rapunzel one. Here, listen and tell me what you think. He called out to a passing servant, excuse me, my good man, could you please fetch Penny Feather the Malufias for us? Tell him that the prince and Lady Ella would like a command performance of the tale of Cinderella. I'm sorry, my lord, the servant replied. Mr. Pennyfeather is unavailable. Well, he hasn't been seen for days, actually. It's the talk of the palace. We assumed you would have heard by now. No one knows where the royal bard is. Well, that explains why I haven't been getting my lullaby these past few nights, Frederick said thoughtfully. Frederick. Maybe something awful has happened to Pennyfeather, Ella said, sounding a bit too excited by the prospect. We should check into it. Come on, let's go. Uh, we need to figure out who was the last person to see him. Let's start by asking at the gate. Oh, I'm sure it's nothing so dramatic, Frederick said quickly. The only thing he had a harder time imagining than a crime occurring within the royal palace was himself investigating such a crime. He's probably just off at a bard convention somewhere, one of those gatherings where they vote on the precise number of feather the minstrel should have in his cap, and that sort of thing. Um, but don't worry, just because Penny Feather himself isn't here doesn't mean we can't have music. I'll just send for... Never mind the song, Frederick Ellis said, <sighs> taking a deep breath. Remember how we were just talking about my sheltered childhood? Frederick nodded. Now that I'm free, I want to have new experiences. I want to find out what I'm capable of, so if we're not going to look into Pennyfeather's disappearance, what can we do today, she asked. What kind of adventure can we have? Adventure. Right. Frederick pondered his options briefly. Um, it is a lovely day. It's nice and sunny. I'm thinking picnic. Alice slumped. Frederick, I need to do something different. Frederick stared at her like a lost baby rabbit. I hear there's a troop of traveling acrobats in town, Ella suggested. Maybe we could get them in here to teach us some tumbling. Oh, but I've um, got that problem with my ankle, said Prince Frederick. He didn't have a problem with his ankle. How about um, a treasure hunt, Ella proposed excitedly. Some of the kitchen staff were gossiping about a bag of stolen gold that one of your father's old valets hid in the tunnels below the castle. We should try to find it. Oh, um, I can't go below ground level. You know what dampness does to my sinuses, says Prince Frederick. Um, dampness did nothing to his sinuses. Um, can we go boating on the lake? Ella said. I can't swim, said Prince Frederick. And this was true. Ella huffed to Frederick. What can we do? I'm sorry if this sounds rude, but I'm bored. We could have a different kind of picnic, Frederick offered hopefully. We could do, um... We could do breakfast food for lunch. Croissants, poached eggs. How's that for shaking things up? Ella walked back to her horse and hopped up onto the saddle. Go ahead and order your picnic, Frederick, she said flatly. I'm going to ride a bit more while you wait. Okay, Frederick said and waved to her. I'll stay right here. I'm sure you will. You're very good at that, Ella replied. And then she rode off. An hour or so later, Frederick sat out on the palace lawn. Well, on a carefully unfolded blanket, actually. He didn't really want to get grass stains on his white pants. Waiting for his lunch and his fiancée to arrive. A servant arrived and set down a tray of breakfast delicacies in front of Frederick. 
My lord, the man said as he bowed and backed away, there's a message there for you. Frederick saw a folded piece of paper nestled between a bowl of grapefruit slices and a plate of chocolate chip waffles, which sounds amazing. I mean, I know picnics aren't very exciting, but chocolate chip waffle picnic? I, I mean, I would have stuck around for that, maybe. But, okay, so there was a note, though, so Frederick picks up the note with a sudden sinking feeling about what it might say. Sweet, good-hearted Frederick, I'm terribly sorry to do this to you, and I hope that someday you will understand why I had to leave. You seem very comfortable in your life here at the palace. I can't make you into someone who wants to climb mountains, paddle rushing rivers, and explore ancient ruins. You don't want to do those things, and that's fine. It's just not your cup of tea. Your cup of tea is, well, a cup of tea. You're saying something is your cup of tea. That's a way of saying it's something that you enjoy, something you like to do. But I need, Cinderella needs, something more. When you mentioned that song about Rapunzel, it got me thinking. The prince in that story tried to rescue Rapunzel, but Rapunzel ended up rescuing him. Now that girl is an inspiration. So I'm heading off to find her. I think Rapunzel and I'll hit it off. I think she'll make a great partner for hunting down Pennyfeather. And even if we end up finding him at a boring old convention, like you say, who knows what kind of adventures will be in store for us along the way. Frederick, you are a lovely man, and I have nothing but good wishes for you. For what it's worth, that night at the ball really was the most romantic night of my life. All the best, Ella. Frederick dropped the letter onto his empty plate. So, he thought, that ball was the most romantic night of her life, huh? Well, that's not saying much coming from a girl whose typical nights consisted of scraping dead spiders out of cracks in the floorboards, and look how she signed it all the best. That's how you sign a thank you note to your dog walker. Uh-oh, he thinks it. <laughs> it's not a very nice way. She didn't send it by saying, love, Ella, mm-mm, just all the best. Frederick had completely lost his appetite. Reginald, am I really that boring? Frederick was back in his room, sitting slumped on the edge of his cashmere-covered bed, while Reginald, rigid as ever, stood next to him awkwardly, patting the prince's head. Uh, there, there, my lord, the valet answered. I don't think the Countess of Bellsworth would call you boring. Do you remember how elated she was when you taught her how to cha-cha? You have many, many admirers, sir. Yes, Frederick said sorrowfully, but Ella is apparently not among them. It seems that Lady Ella simply seeks a different kind of life than that which you can provide for her here at the palace, Reginald said. Poached eggs! How stupid can I be? Frederick smacked himself on the forehead. There will be other women, my lord. I don't want any other woman. I want Ella. Reginald, what do you think I should do? And be honest with me. Don't just tell me what you think my father would want you to say. Reginald considered this request. He'd been caring for Frederick since the prince was a child, and he'd never been more proud of Frederick than when he saw the young man stand up to his overbearing father. Frederick could use someone as feisty and fearless as Ella in his life. Don't let her get away, Reginald said, dropping his overly stiff posture and speaking in an unusually casual tone. Wow, Frederick gasped, did you just get two inches shorter? Never mind me, Reginald said. Did you hear what I told you? Get a move on, go after Ella. But how? Frederick asked, still bewildered to hear his longtime valet speaking like a regular person. We'll put you on a horse. Charles can show you the basics. You don't need to be the world's best rider. You just need to be able to get around. Stick to the roads and you'll be fine. But I know you're scared, Frederick, but here's my advice. Get over it. Ella wants someone as adventurous as she is, a real hero. Then I've got no hope. Frederick sulked. I'm a fantastic dresser. My penmanship is top notch. I'm really good at being a prince, but I'm pretty lousy at being a hero. Reginald looked him in the eye. There's a bit of courage in you there somewhere. Find it. Go catch up with Ella, wherever she is, and just see what happens. She might be impressed enough that you've left the palace. There's no way my father will allow me to do this, said Prince Frederick. We won't tell him, said Reginald. He'll notice I'm gone eventually, and when he does, he'll send his men to retrieve me. Whichever way you go, I'll send them in the opposite direction, said Reginald. I'm still not sure I should. It's really dangerous out there. That's your father talking, said Reginald. Look, if you go on this journey, you're not just doing it for Ella. You're also doing it for that little boy who once wanted to try everything. Frederick said, do you mean my cousin Lawrence who broke his leg trying to fly with those wax wings? 
Reginald's not talking about Cousin Lawrence. He's talking about when Frederick was a little boy and he was brave and wanted to go on adventures. Reginald looked at him soberly. Frederick, you don't really remember your mother, but I do. And I know what she'd want you to do. Frederick stood up. Okay, I'll go. That's the spirit, Reginald said. Frederick marched out of his room. And a second later, he marched right back in. <laughs> I should probably change into something more appropriate for the outdoors, he said. Reginald put his arm around him. You don't own anything more appropriate for the outdoors, he said with a smile. Come, let's get you down to the stables. The next morning, after several hours of secret intensive riding lessons, Prince Frederick trotted out through the palace gates on horseback, with Reginald and Charles the groom waving him goodbye. His eyes were tightly closed, his arms wrapped around the horse's neck. Then something dawned on him. Wait, he called back to Reginald. I don't know where I'm going. Ella's note said she was going to find that Rapunzel girl, Reg Reginald said. Those bars are never very good about telling you exactly where their stories take place. But based on the clunky rhymes, I'm pretty sure the song of Rapunzel is the work of Lyrical Leaf, the bard from Sturmhagen. <laughs> with a name like Lyrical Leaf, you think the guy could come up with better lines than her hair was real long, not short like a prawn. That's not a very, he's right, that's not a very good song. <laughs> anyway, I try Sturmhagen, head south. But Sturmhagen, isn't that supposed to be full of monsters? Frederick said, his eyes growing wider by the second. Ride fast, Charles the groom called out. With any luck, you'll catch up to Lady Ella before you reach the border. I can't ride fast, Frederick said. I'm trying hard to make sure I ride forward. Then so far you're succeeding, Reginald yelled. Stay strong. Frederick gripped his horse tighter, wondering what in the world he'd gotten himself into. Within 24 hours, he would be sniffling through a rainstorm, wishing he'd never left home. In a little over a week, he'd be quivering in the shadow of a raging giant. And another week after that, he would end up at the Stumpy Boarhound. But for now, he was on his way to Sturmhagen. That's the end of that chapter about how the Prince Charming has lost his bride, has lost track of Cinderella. Let's see. We've read for a bit now, so I think we're going to stop, but we can read more next time and keep going. Our next chapter is called Prince Charming Defends Some Vegetables. So you know it's going to be a good one. This book is very silly. <laughs> so again, this is Prince Charming. So uh, the story about Prince Charming and the Hero's Guide to Saving Your Kingdom by Christopher Healy. We do have this book available at TBPL on our cloud library system. So if you wanted to read ahead, you could log into cloud library using your TBPL card and you can find it as either an ebook and I think we have the audiobook too. But if you'd rather just keep reading with me, we will be back next week and we will read another chapter or so. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you again next time. Bye.